Up, y'all. These are historic, historical speeches. They're very famous, so I expect you to do your absolute best on these speeches. We will be presenting these next Monday. Is that clear? No. So, John, wait. Yes. Yeah, are you presenting? Go to your his. You don't have to remember them, but go to your historic speech. Um, you will find it, and uh, you will find a template or a PDF. You can click it. Your speech will be found in there. So the entire speech is in there. Okay. So just go to that assignment and your speech will be there in that PDF. You do not have to memorize it, but the more you remember it, the better eye contact we can get, the better delivery we can get, the better your tone will be, the better your confidence will be. So now let me teach you a little bit about public speaking. We did uh, name speeches uh, with little to no lecturing or anything about public speaking. We probably had one lecture about it. So let me give you a real lecture. All right. With the art of public speaking, y'all, there's one, there's two things that you need to know. You need to know the general purpose and the specific purpose. I suggest you take notes. That is my suggestion to you. The general and the specific purpose. Anytime you get up in front of an audience to give a speech, your general purpose should be to inform, persuade, and entertain. Your general purpose is to inform, persuade, and entertain. Everything okay with your computer? Yeah, I can it Come look at me, see how close I can get from my head. No, your, so, head, your head's cut off. So you gotta go back, back. You might wanna just move this, because it's still cut off. Inform, persuade, and entertain. Inform, persuade, and entertain is your specific purpose. Let me hear, I'm sorry, is your general purpose. Let me hear it out loud. To, your general purpose is to what? Inform, persuade, and entertain. Now look at me. Everybody look at me. All eyes on me. Tupac. All eyes on me. All eyes on me. Your general purpose is to what? Inform, persuade, and entertain. It is to what? Inform. Not perform. Inform. I keep hearing perform. Inform. Inform. Like informative. One, two, three. Inform, persuade, and entertain. It is what? Inform, persuade, and entertain. Are you not to detain? Right? Why would you get up in front of somebody and be boring? Make sure your speech is entertaining. Capture their attention. You only have the first 30 seconds of a speech to capture someone's attention. Be informative. The word informative, you're giving information, you're informing somebody. Data, statistics, right? That's informing people. And uh, sometimes you have to be very persuasive. Maybe your speech is about affirmative action, right? Sir. Is it still needed? So you're persuading us to believe that it's needed or it's no longer needed. That's why you need to be persuasive. Your specific purpose of any speech, your specific purpose is what you want your audience to know, to do, or to feel. The specific purpose is what you want your audience to know, to do, or to feel. It is the audience's reaction that you desire. So however you want them to feel, if it's sad, use words that are melancholy. If you want them to be excited and motivated to take call to action, use inspiring words, motivational words, right? So your specific purpose is what you want your audience to know, to do, or to feel. It is the audience's reaction that you desire. Your specific purpose is what? What you are doing. No, what you want the audience to know, feel, and do. All that, yes. It's what you want your audience to know, to do, or to feel. The information you want them to know. Maybe you're doing something on voting rights. What do you want them to do? Vote. All right. You see that? Maybe you're doing it on suicide. What do you want them to feel? Be aware. All right. Y'all get how that applies in every single speech that you do? Mm -hmm. Now that you understand the general purpose and specific purpose, let's get into it. A lot of times, when we get in front of people, we do what? Get nervous. nervous. Oh, don't we get nervous, right? 
So you gotta understand nervous. So why are some people so why are so many people nervous when they're about to give a speech? All eyes on you. All eyes on you. Why else? They're not comfortable. Ooh, they're not comfortable, right? That's a good one. What else? I don't think they'll make a mistake. They think they'll make a mistake. Yes, yes. Any more? Any more reasons why people are so nervous? Because uh, people judge, man. People be judging you, right? Looking at your shoes, right? All that stuff. So the mind is a wonderful thing, y'all. It, it starts working the minute you are born, and it doesn't stop working until when? No, you get up and get in front of people to speak. Then you can't even remember your name, right? And your mind just stop working. But that's okay. Understand that nervousness is natural. You get it? Nervousness is natural. So what we have to do is understand that it's natural and learn to do what? Work through it and work with it, okay? So that's what we're here to teach you. So they did a study of phobias, right? Y'all know what a phobia is? Yes. Okay, everybody know what a phobia is a fear. Now, on a scale from 1 to 10, number 1 being the most fearful thing you can be afraid of, what do you think number 1 was? Spiders. Sharks. Spiders. Public speaking. Spiders. Spiders. Heights. Heights. Lions. Heights. Lions, tigers, and bears. Clowns. Oh, my. Clowns. Death. Death. Like Let's talk about death for a minute. What do y'all think death was on the scale of things? Number one, two. Number one, number two, maybe? Number five. Number ten. Six. Death fell at number six. I heard public speaking. Where do you think public speaking fell? Number two. Number one. Number one. But that doesn't make sense. How can death be number six? So if you think about it, if you think about that analogy, if you were, if you were given an option at a funeral... You would rather be the person in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> That's crazy. Why are we so fearful of public speaking? Uh, so when people are comfortable with their surroundings and peers, they are more likely to grasp and accept new ideas. Frequently, people come across to training sessions, tents from prior activities, or recent or recent the fact resent the fact that they are present. So a good icebreaker can help turn around such negative feelings. So my little phobia joke, what would be considered an icebreaker. So feel free when you start your speeches, well not for the historic speeches, but when you're doing your own originals, feel free to use an icebreaker. That's a good tactic, right? That's an attention-getting tactic. Another attention-getting tactic is using a startling data, right? Something that may catch people's attention. Like, whoa, I didn't know that. All right, so public speaking and the human brain. As we see, what's that on the board? The brain. The brain, right? My big brain scientist in here. Did you know that all the emotional and physical responses that you have are due to stress and they're set off by chemical reactions? Did y'all know that? Yes. So all the stress you have really starts in your brain and it releases chemicals into your body. Hormones. Now, hormones. This is where they're coming from. Does everybody see these glands right here? Yeah. Those two yellow glands? Yeah. In your brain, they are the size of almonds. They are called the amygdala. Can you say amygdala? amygdala. Not alligator. Say amygdala. amygdala. Somebody said a duma amygdala. <laughs> say amygdala. amygdala. That's it. I guarantee you that's a test question. Amygdala. Amygdala is responsible for all of your anxiety. All of your fight and flight is in caused by that what? Amygdala. Thank you so much. And if you misspell it on your test, I understand. It's a tough word, but just know what it means. Amygdala. Amygdala. And it's right here in your hippocampus, okay? Remember, this part of your brain is your frontal lobe. Hippocampus is towards the back. Amygdala. Amygdala. Learn a little bit today. So, um, present it. We're going to talk about something called um, now the amygdala. What it does when presented with this conflict, your body responses by increasing your breathing rate, pumping more adrenaline, and causing more blood to rush to your veins. In short, you have more energy than you know what to deal with to, for the conflict that you're facing. So, basically, your brain switches to fight or flight. Now, we have that in us so we can do superhuman things at the right time, right? Yeah. It's called that adrenaline, right? Yes. Is that why, like, with people with bipolar, when they go into a manic phase, 
they get like unbelievable strength. And, oh yeah, it's very possible. Yeah, and it's, like anger. That's why that mother who sees the car on her child can lift that car up. Yeah. That adrenaline, that superhuman strength. But the problem is when we get nervous, then that adrenaline kicks in at the wrong time, right? And then when we find ourselves with way more energy than we know what to deal with, which causes, can cause for others extreme anxiety. Yes, ma'am. Is that why, like, when you're up and you're speaking, that is that why you kind of, like, move around a lot and you can't... Sometimes that fidgety energy so that we don't really know how to control, that twitchiness. Yes. There's a theory. It's called the amygdala hijack. And I'm not talking about break yourself. Not that kind of hijack, right? <laughs> but it could. So the amygdala hijack is when one, um, one experiences an amygdala hijack where it overtakes the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, okay? And there is little to no ability to rely on intelligence or reasoning. So the effect that the hijack, uh, the effect is that energy is drawn exclusively into the hijack. So there's a decrease in working memory and adrenaline is released and can be present uh, for up to 18 minutes and other hormones can actually remain in the bloodstream for three to four hours. Fact. This gives a whole new meaning to never making a decision out of anger. Why? Because scientifically, you are not thinking logically because your neocortex has been what? Hijacked. Hijacked by these chemicals, right? So your intelligence level may decrease, right? Your memory may decrease because of all of these chemicals. So let me tell you, never make a decision out of anger. There's so many people in prison right now who made a split second decision and did not use the acronym IDEAS. They didn't identify the problem, deepen their understanding, enumerate the options, right? And they didn't scrutinize, right? They didn't critically think, right? That's why we have so many passion crimes. This is why passion crimes are a legal defense. Oh, I caught her, I caught her in bed with another man. I had to kill them both. Uh. It was a passion crime, spur in the moment. I could not think logically because of the situation. You get it? This is why it's a legal defense for that reason. Science. That's science. Anatomy. Huh? Can't you get off on that? Yes. You can get less time. You get mass. You might drop it down to mass on it, but that's what happens. That's a, that's a defense. But if you walk away and grab a weapon, then you had time to think about it. And that's, that's possible. Thing, that's like. Get you a good lawyer. It could be second degree, but it depends. I saw somebody get off on mass order because they did a passion crime, which it really was. But I saw somebody get off in court, kill one of my friends. He was staying with his ex-wife and dude and the husband. You know, they were separated, but he broke in the house and killed him. And he, was and he got off for manslaughter. But that's premeditated. Crime. It was premeditated. It was premeditated, but that defense worked. So, let's look at the effects of the amygdala hijack, shall we? If you don't think it's real, let's look at it. You like the brain, the brain likes you too. I like the brain. I said the brain. I really said the brain. I really said the brain. No, you didn't. You just tried to make it sound like I said the brain. Oh, we don't have audio. Let's play it. All right, it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. Okay, I'm not this. Yeah, this, this is on Schoology, for those who found it, this is on Schoology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of my original lectures, y'all. I put this in Schoology. This is an original. Schoology ain't give y'all this, yeah, it's me. Yeah, I can tell from the way you worded it that it's good. Yeah, this is original. Um, why you not? Why you not following along? Hey, you got a if you've been following along, dude, what's up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything is on Schoology, y'all. You know how much is on Everything is on Schoology.
but the Ball State women's, women's team shot down and ended up doing poorly. And okay. we're going to continue on now. And the Ladies Cardinals will play an Iowa tournament starting this Friday. Before the Ball State baseball team kicks off its conference season this, week, this weekend, the Cards will battle an in in-state rival Indiana tomorrow. Tomorrow's game will be the meeting between the two. Beating both. <laughs> being hijacked right now. Yeah. They take it over. Oh, yeah, the truth is real. are on the four on on the year, and they have won six of its last seven games tomorrow. <laughs> Will be the game three at 3 p.m. Switching to Ball State men's tennis, it seems less. We play on. It seems every week they have a player. I think y'all yeah, get the point. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, stop, all right? Keep watching. And I think we're going to do this. Thank you. Needless to say, y'all, that was his first day on the job and his, and his last. last. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, Definitely God. was his so last. Of so course. Hey, man. Hey. Just take so let me ask you this: home. What are some y'all saw what happened to him? What are some of the emotions that you feel when you get nervous? I get mad. Like, I talk to just, me. I do just like that. I start like I have to take deep breaths in and like calm myself down because I start as y'all notice I start my voice starts to shake and stuff. And I'll be scared and then it just I can't control it. I just know. So what else? What are some deeply, emotions that you feel? Give me an emotion. I don't have any. Scary. I just start getting down in my um, notes. Looking down, give me an emotion. Scared. Panic attacks. Panic attacks. What else? Extremely happy. Extremely happy. What else? Scared. Scared. Anxious. What else? People find things funny. People find things funny. What other emotions that you feel before you get up when you get up in front of people? Um, not too sure. Not too confident. Not too confident. Dreading it a little bit. What else? Butterflies in the stomach. Butterflies in the stomach. Check this out. A lot of people reported rapid heartbeat. That who? Heart jumping out your shirt, right? Also, shaky knees. That can be another sign of anxiety. Sweaty hands. You ever shake somebody's hand after a presentation? Like, hey, how you doing? You're like, oh, God. <laughs> hands just sweaty. Sweaty hands. Quivering voice like our nervous reporter. Quivering voice. And I'm nervous today. Oh, God. <laughs> right? So, a lot of times your octaves can change, right? When you get nervous. That's another effect. Increased perspiration. Sweating. Anybody ever see that person that's giving the speech and, and they're talking about the diaphragm? They're like, look at over here, but everybody's looking over here and under here. It's just like, whoosh, real nasty. Increased perspiration. And if you get very nervous, you may experience butterflies in your stomach, right? Because of change in the digestive system. That's the Bee Gees. <laughs> the bubble guts, right? That can happen too. Just, you get those bubble guts, so that can happen. So learning how to become an effective public speaker can be the key difference between success and failure in your life, at home, at work, or in your community. Because at home, you need to communicate. At work, you need to communicate. And at school, you need to communicate effectively, okay? So being a good public speaker is very important. So as we said, somebody, let me see, Corey, look at me. What is the general purpose of any public speech? The general purpose. Hold, hold, hold up, hold up. Miss Reed, what is the general purpose of a public speech? Uh, ah, look at me. General purpose. Inform. Uh-huh. Persuade. Uh-huh. Mm. Mm. Entertain. Entertain. Give me some. Yeah. Uh, good job. Good job. Duke, what is the general purpose? Let's give me a general purpose. What is it? Inform, persuade, and entertain. She helped you out. What is the specific purpose? Oh, to know, to do, or to build. Hey, my man. Give me some. 
The specific purposes of what you want your audience to know, to do, or to feel. Good job. So your general purpose, as it stated, is to inform, persuade, and entertain. Say it again with me, y'all. Perform, perform, persuade, and entertain. I think I said perform. <laughs> Better perform. It's all you. It is one more time. It is to inform, persuade, and entertain. I think y'all got it. And the specific purpose is a concise statement indicating what you want your audience to know, no, to, to do, do, or to, to feel. feel. When you finish your speech, it identifies the audience response that you desire. Isn't it beautiful to already know it before it comes up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So remember the specific purpose. Good chi. Good chi. Head up, please. We don't want to show the appearance of sleep in here because it is the cousin of death. All right. So we got to talk about large group versus small group. We only have a few minutes left. But in addressing the audience, uh, be it even before or 100, one factor will remain the same. The format of your presentation. You will still have an opening, a development, and a closing. However, there are major differences when delivering with a, with a small group or a large group, OK? Anybody can think of any quick differences? Projections. Projections, yeah. clearly. You don't have to project as much with a small group as you will with a large. Good one. Eye contact. Eye contact. Yeah. Clearly, you have a much larger room to look over. Movement. Movement. You'll have a bigger stage. What else? Uncomfortableness. Body language may be different. Is that a word? Comfortableness. Yeah. Comfortableness. Comfortability. It's not as loud. So, obviously, you would need more volume with a larger audience. Let's move on. It's a difference from people hearing me in the front, but people need to hear you in the back, too, if it's a large audience. Yeah. Also, you will need to physically scan the room. That's that eye contact that you said, right? Remember what I taught you, uh, eye scan. Make sure you go to the extreme right, all the way to the extreme left, yeah. okay? To make sure you're including everyone, okay? okay? It takes practice. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. Like I tell you, man, just look at people's shirts, man. Look at people's shirts. With a small audience, it's easy to make eye contact with each individual by addressing a larger group. Make eye contact is only possible by focusing on different areas. Yeah. So that's that scan. I'm looking over here, but not at anybody specifically. All right? Over here, but not at anybody specifically, but you feel like you're getting eye, all the eye contact. Right. So that's what it is. Audio video, audio visuals. Make sure that your audio and visuals are large enough for everybody to see in the room when it's a large group. Small group, it may not, you know, it's easier for y'all to see this, but if this was a, a hundred people in here, people in the back would not be able to even read this. So make sure your monitor, your projector is large. Make sure your audio and your visual aids are large. Uh, while the dynamic delivery is the goal of everyone in public speaking, you cannot be seen or heard, uh, hear your visual aids if they're not readable. Because uh, that's more than half of the battle. So part of the secret of public speaking is being confident that you will say and what you do is comfortably seen and heard by everyone in the room, not just those lucky few people in the front. Being prepared means you have done what? Your research. Your research. What else? Practice. 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 Oh, that's my favorite one. Practice. Study. Study. What else? Ready. Knowledge. Being ready. Knowledge. You got the knowledge. Being prepared means you've done what? Huh? <laughs> you did what? Being, Being presentable. You Maybe that's it. your appearance. You Let's look at some of these things. You've researched your topic. I heard that. You've practiced your speech several times before you've delivered it. Professional public speakers rehearse their speech 20 times before they even go up and present to people. Make sure you have developed a logical and coherent outline. Remember, we're going to go over outlines on how to do them. They will really help you. Also, make sure... All right, let's, we're gonna, we don't have time to get into audience analysis, but next week we'll go over audience analysis, okay? We'll go over uh, demographic audience analysis. What do you think demographic audience analysis is? Well, I'm I'm to. To. I it's saw Ms. Brown's hand up. So yes. Tailoring your um, your speech to the audience. So if you're talking to kids, you're probably not going to talk about like big words. That's right. Tailoring it to your audience. So that means you must know their age. You must know their religion. You must know what else? Who you talk to? Ethnic background. Yeah. You must know who you talk to. Yeah. So your demographic yeah. comes all that. To? Psychological audience analysis. What do you think that is? 
Uh, their mindset. Their mindset. What you want to know about? what their attitudes are, their likes their and behaviors. dislikes. You want to know what their beliefs are. But why? Why do you want to know these things? So you can so better so relate. Touch base. For a specific purpose. Well, you, it'll help. There you go. It will listen up. Listen up real quick. It will help you develop your specific purpose. That's one thing. And also, if you're being persuasive, it'll help you know people's values. Because everybody, you can't change their mind. Or you may be trying to reinforce their mind. So it's good to know what audience you're talking to. And the last one is situational analysis. What do you think that is? Conditional like what situation? One at a time. Somebody raise your hand. Anthony. Like, uh, you know what to say stuff and what not to. Like, you want to you, know, like, you want to sit here and, and talk about dead people, like, you know, if that makes sense. That would be the perfect place to talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I see where you're going. Miss Bell, help him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> It's like yeah. conditional, like, you know, in a certain situation, there's an appropriate time to say whatever yeah. at that situation. Yeah. So I'm just going to piggyback on him to help Anthony out just a little bit. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be at a funeral and be talking about sports scores, right? Yeah. yeah. Just like the Braves died in the game last night, uh, but they fought that. hard, he fought hard. You know, just be careful of the situation that you're in, right? Yeah. Just like you wouldn't wear a wedding dress to a, to the mall, it's not that time. So be mindful of what you're talking about in one situation. Class dismiss. I love you all. Okay. Remember to love yourself. Next Monday. Oh, we just have to go over. I guess he'll give Hold on, y'all. Hold up, real quick. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. You want to do her? Yeah. Thank you. I'll open it. Oh, I'll check in. I'll check into it. Yes.